This evening, we are going to talk about urinary incontinence. So Pam is going to talk to us about many aspects of urinary incontinence, uh, not only the definitions, uh, but also the investigations and how you as a primary care practitioners in the main uh, can in fact uh, manage women very uh, successfully. He will also talk further about treatments and surgical uh, uh, treatments as well. Pam is a gynaecologist. He's a urogynaecologist and a pelvic reconstruction surgeon with a fellowship in urogynaecology. He's a member of the International Continence Society, the International Urogyne Association and the Urogynecological Society of Australia. He's in charge of the pelvic floor clinics and perineal clinic at Dandenong Hospital. And he works with us as a urogynecologist uh, at our Jean Hales Clayton office. He has a keen, clean in, keen, not clean, keen interest in pelvic floor uh, dysfunction and is actively involved in teaching and research at Monash Health. Thank you, Pam. We look forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Liz. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. So I'm going to share my screen and put the um, PowerPoint up. Share. Very good. Okay, then. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, <coughs> thank you for your interest and your time coming in. And thank you uh, to Tracy and Liz for making tonight possible. Um, so um, I'm going to start without any further um, discussion right into the urinary incontinence to the nitty gritty bits of it. So um, um, if you've got questions, you might write them up. We'll try to get as many of them through as many of them as we can through the night. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm sure we would be able to make up for those ones unanswered. And thank you also to sending questions in advance. We've tried to incorporate as much as we can um, in the presentation. So hopefully we'll answer most of your questions. So moving on. So we're going to talk um, in terms of the overview and the epidemiology, the different types of it, classification of urine incontinence, uh, what goes in the history and examination, how you investigate and further management options. So um, this is a, a slide that um, uh, almost always is uh, sort of in my talks uh, and uh, it kind of shows the pelvic floor muscles right at the bottom of the uh, female pelvis with three main organs, as you can see here. So in the, uh, I may actually refer to it also in the anterior compartment, you've got the bladder, bladder neck and the urethra. In the middle compartment, which is also referred to as apical compartment, you've got the uterus and cervix. And in the posterior compartment, what you've got is your rectum and your anal sphincter complex. So, um, we're going to talk about urinary incontinence, so it's anterior compartment. But before moving on, I just want to give this idea to you, so you, you have that in the back of your mind, and hopefully it stays. Um, so pelvic floor has got three functions. It contains the pelvic organs, it provides continence, and is involved in sexual function. So if you define these as the functions, Therefore, the dysfunction is going to be issue with the containment, therefore prolapse, issues with incontinence, such as urinary incontinence or anal incontinence, or referred to also as a fecal incontinence, and female sexual, sexual dysfunction. So these are the three dysfunction that emerges out of what you define as a function. So I'm going to move on, and um, further on, we will talk about um, the urinary incontinence. So um, it is, it's a very common condition, okay? It goes without saying, uh, any GP, any, any gynecologist, any urologist, this is a day-to-day, -day, uh, everyday presentation um, uh, complaint of women coming to clinic. There's, and most often it's actually in association with the other presentations of the um, female pelvic floor dysfunction, but we're gonna focus on the urinary incontinence side of the female pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, so in summary, generally speaking, unfortunately, sadly, as we get older, we get urinary incontinence. So it becomes more common as we, as we get older and it becomes more severe. 
So generally speaking, uh, it goes without saying again that the elderly women are the ones who are dealing with this uh, more, much more significantly and more commonly compared to the younger population. And generally, you would say that in the uh, you would see that in the uh, in the younger group, it's much less common compared to the elderly. So. It is very important also to bring this up in your consultations if you're seeing a woman from other perspective, because sometimes it just is taken as a normal variant or um, is not, I'm old, this is sort of normal to be having urinary incontinence, which is not actually. So we'll go through that. So what is urinary incontinence? There is no fancy definition for it. Any involuntary loss of urine is urinary incontinence, as simple as it gets, okay? So um, this is how you define urinary incontinence. But there are different types of it. The different types of it that makes the management also different. So you've got the stress urinary incontinence is the complaint of involuntary loss of urine associated with any kind of exertion. So jumping, laughing, coughing, running, um, trampling, star jumps pushing something, reaching top shelves, trying to grab something, you know, all those kind of things are related to this, um, are actually defined as stress urinary incontinence. Anything that leads to the increase in abdominal pressure that overcomes the closure pressure of the urethra, literally, like in very scientific terms, but normally it's the complaint of loss of urine with any kind of exertion. Urge urinary incontinence, on the other hand, is the type of incontinence is associated with urgency, is an involuntary loss of urine associated with urgency. And moving on, we've got postural incontinence. Postural incontinence is the time that the patient, when they move, especially when they want to go from one position to another position, they leak urine. So this can be sometimes in the form of stress incontinence because of an increased or rise in the abdominal pressure that would overcome the closure pressure, as I mentioned, or it might actually be related to urge incontinence because at times with an exertion, you can have a detrusive contraction in your bladder. So this is important to take that into consideration that not all postural incontinences are necessarily related to um, uh, purely being stress incontinence. It might be urge incontinence. Moving on, nocturnal enuresis or bedwetting, which you uh, can most often would see in children, like a pediatric condition, but certainly, you know, in my practice, given my sort of uh, what I have um, made myself be, I would see these women, of course, uh, coming with nocturnal enuresis, either as primary ones or as secondary ones. Mixed urinary incontinence is the presence of stress and urge together. So if you've got stress incontinence and urge incontinence together, is, is called mixed incontinence. And there's a kind of a tendency um, in, in practices trying to find out which one is dominant, which I think is very sensible, actually. You know, if someone has got mixed urinary incontinence and it's stress incontinence dominant or urge dominant, then it would give you a clue which direction you want to go and or... Uh, what kind of treatments you would envisage in the long term for the woman. So these two are a li little bit different um, in terms of like the, the, old, the ultimate outcome. Continuous incontinence is just continuous insensible loss of urine. So you don't sense that there is, you don't have any sensation, it just continuously goes. It's like fistula patients, for example, this good continuously. And of course, the coital incontinence, something that people don't want to volunteer, don't want to talk about it, and you need to ask for it. Almost often, you have to ask for it. This is not something that comes out normally from patients. And again, just, a, just quickly on that, with coital incontinence, the two types of it, um, it either happens with penetration or happens with orgasm. And we think that the one associated with penetration is most likely associated uh, like to be a variant of stress incontinence, whereas the one associated with um, orgasm, it's likely a variation of urge incontinence. However, um, this is uh, like an evolving field and there's more and more research being done in this and we will sort of hopefully have more understanding of this in the years to come. Then we've got bladder storage symptoms, another very typical kind of presentations that people come to um, or complain of. Increased data on frequency is that the, um, the number of micturitions or uh, trips to toilet for voiding is um, uh, deemed to be more than usual or normal by the woman. And it's literally what they would say. Um, they would say that, you know, 
uh, the number has increased and I'm going to toilet it too often. But um, again, we will need to ask how often and we will get to that in the next few slides. Nocturia is the interruption of sleep. So the patient falls asleep, is woken up from sleep by the sensation to do a, to do a void and then falls back to sleep. Okay, so this is important. It's preceded by sleep and then it's followed by sleep. So if you wake up and then uh, you, uh, before you go to bed again and fall asleep, you make three trips to the toilet, it counts as one basically, okay, in terms of like the, the, the nocturia itself. Um, and the ones that happens before you fall to sleep, like you go to bed early, but it takes three hours to fall asleep, those ones do not, do not count in the number of nocturia as such. And then the urgency was the very, very simple explanation, of course, a compelling uh, desire to avoid um, that is difficult to postpone. And overactive bladder is a constellation of symptoms. So therefore it's called syndrome, OAB. OAB is, um, is the urgency, frequency, nocturia. It can be associated with urgent continence or not. And generally, um, there is a bit of a, uh, there is a, another version of classifying this also to, to two subtypes. We say OAB dry and OAB wet. So OAB dry is the time that someone has got overactive bladder, but they are able to make it to the toilet. Whereas if they're not able to make it to the toilet, it would be OAB wet, meaning that it's associated with urge incontinence. So what is normal? Well, as I said, no incontinence is normal. So we don't uh, accept any, any, any normality in uh, leaking urine. It will make sense. Normal voiding, about seven to eight times during waking hours. So that would mean roughly about every three to four hours. So, um, and then uh, how many, like if you wake up once at night, it would uh, sort of consider to be a normal variant in terms of um, nocturia. So nocturia is really defined at more than once. So you wake up two or three times to go to the toilet. Now, risk factors, there's so many things in it. So, so many different things that are involved, you know, aging, of course, you know, you know the change in the uh, consistency of the tissues. Um, with aging, there is sometimes weight gain. With aging, there is birth, childbirth in it. But all those things also count, uh, can count as an independent risk factor. Um, pregnancy is a very important risk factor, as well as vaginal delivery. Vaginal delivery of any kind is a risk factor for urinary incontinence, and especially instrumental delivery, and uh, amongst them, forceps is the biggest risk factor, of course. But as you see, you know, dementia, collagen defect, smoking, chronic uh, obstructive airway disease, asthma, obesity, hysterectomy, constipation, uh, constipation is really, really important. It's a big risk factor for this. So major contributing factors, coffee. We love coffee. Someone else is also drinking coffee now. <laughs> Alcohol and smoking. So three important ones. Always need to cover that in your history. It is very important. But there are other things too that you either find in your history or in your examination. Pelvic organ prolapse, excess fluid intake, infection, medications and uh, poor mobility or poor access to toilet, which is most often uh, associated in the elderly or in uh, nursing home patients, actually. This is the list of uh, reversible causes that you need to look into for women who present with urinary incontinence, acute onset urinary incontinence, especially in the elderly, because they're reversible. So it goes with the acronym of diapers, and it stands for delirium infection, atrophic vaginitis, pharmaceuticals as in medications, for, for example, diuretics, psychological conditions, excess fluid intake, restricted mobility, and stool constipation. So um, this is basically the list of those ones that you need to take into consideration and tick them off as you would investigate a woman for uh, urinary incontinence, especially in the elderly population, new onset ones, or the ones worsening. Now, history taking. I just wanted to say, <laughs> When you buy, when you want to buy a house, you might think it's irrelevant. There are three rules. Yeah, it says rule one is location, rule two location, rule three location. Okay, in urinary incontinence, there are three rules: history, history, history. I hope that it, it, you will remember this. This is like a like a notion that I use. 
as much as you more you invest in history, it's, it would pay off better in the long run, okay? You would investigate better, you would understand better, and you would be able to provide a better care. And you would not do unnecessary investigations and be more mindful about what you're doing, actually. So history, history, history. So establish the presence and the severity, okay? Like, have you noticed any laws or leaking of the urine? How often it happens? How long it's been happening? Find the bad triggering factors. Uh, pad usage, how many pads do you need to use? You know, the sanitary products, all those kind of things. You need to go through them. Ask about daytime frequency, nocturia. How much is a bother is it actually? And what it, uh, how kind of like, uh, how effect does it have in your day-to-day -day lifestyle, your personal, uh, lifestyle, relationship, professional, etc. The type of incontinence you need to find out as we discussed earlier. So this is how you would make that diagnosis also. So for the woman, leaking urine is leaking urine. She, like majority of the women, do not necessarily differentiate actually between stress incontinence and urge incontinence or mixed incontinence. For them, is just leaking urine that is ruining their lives but it's actually your job to take the right history and ask the right questions and to differentiate between them and try to get that key answers from the you know, history to, um, to try to put it into the right category. Overactive bladder symptom kind of questions. You want to go about daytime frequency, nocturia, nocturnal enuresis, urgency, etc. And voiding symptoms. We want to ask about the voiding, as in hesitancy, porous stream, intermittent flow, post void dribble, straining, etc. And there are prolapse symptoms such as lump, heaviness, bulge, pressure, dragging sensation, protrusion. However, the woman describes it. Some people might just come and say, "I just feel like a, it's like a grapefruit in my vagina, like a big, heavy pressure lump there that I feel." So anything that they would volunteer, you just need to elaborate on that. Digitation and splinting of the vagina or the perineum to help them void or open bowels also. It's very important to take that into consideration. Now, key questions and how it might be relevant to conditions such as like poor voiding, you know, incomplete emptying and poor voiding can lead to overactive bladder because you incompletely empty your bladder. You just need to go to toilet very frequently, increase daytime frequency and urgency. Fluid intake, you know, water, caffeinated beverages, diet, etc., soup, alcohol, you know, all those kind of things that you need to, in, uh, you need to think about it. Whatever goes in needs to come out. Chronic raised abdominal pressure, you know, constipation, chronic cough, uh, abdominal masses, tumors, fibroids, big fibroids pressing on the, on the bladder. It doesn't allow the bladder to fill up. Therefore, you would get urgency, frequency, and, you know, urge incontinence potentially. Urogenital atrophy, there's a direct correlation between estrogen deficiency and OAB symptoms. Medical history, you want to find about overload conditions, fluid overload. Previous pelvic surgery of either kind, you know, for cancer or incontinence surgeries different kinds of medications, neurological conditions that might lead to neurogenic bladders, and obstetric history that as goes without saying that's very important, very important that you need to consider all of that. So how to assess the severity? You know, there are different methods, but you can ask the woman actually, you know, about the degree of the bother and you know, how, how, how much of a compromise is it for them. Um, use patient own words, you know, um, affecting my life significantly, severely, you know, those kind of things. Number of pads they use, absorbent products that they use. Um, you can use a visual analog scale, you know, from zero to 10, from like, what would you score the, you know, the bother of this for you? Or you can use your Likert, Likert scores, as in like smiley faces, those kind of things. Or you can use validated questionnaires. The most commonly validated questionnaire that we use is a bladder diary, and uh, there is ICIQUISF stands for International Consultation of Incontinence Questionnaire, Urinary Incontinence, short form. And then ICIQ, again, the same abbreviation, OAB is OAB, overactive bladder. IIQ is Incontinence Impacts Questionnaire and Urogenital Distress Inventory. So these are abbreviated versions, the shorter versions. And I've got a couple of them here. So this is Urogenital Distress Inventory. I use them regularly because at the top of my job, you might as well use it. It is good actually to assess the, 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 the improvement in the severity or the bother of the symptoms after a treatment. So you start a treatment for them, you want to see how much of improvement they've made. You can actually use this and look at the scores in the end. 
or the in, uh, incontinence impact questionnaire, you know, the way that, you know, ability to do household chores, you know, physical uh, recreation, entertainment activities, etc., and then you get a total score of this. So if you make a difference, significant difference in the total score after the treatment, of course, it means that your treatment is being successful or having a meaningful effect. Frequency volume chart and gladiator, or frequency volume chart is a 24 hour chart in which uh, you would record uh, uh, frequency and the volume, like how many times that you have drank something and how many times you've voided, and then you measure the void basically. So that's how it's called the frequency volume chart. But it can turn into a blood diary if you add extra bits to it, as in pad usage, incontinence, episodes, degree of incontinence, and the episodes of urgency and sensation will also be recorded. So this is something that you can use to assess much more details of the uh, voiding. And usually it's done for two to three days. Generally, we, we, we would love to have three days, but it's a bit cumbersome, especially for the elderly again. So two days is still okay. And this is an example of this that you can actually use for women to, um, to uh, or, or even men, to be honest, doesn't make a difference in this case, but you know, I'm a gynecologist, so we use uh, for women. And this is how we, you know, this woman has got sort of like these episodes of incontinence and she's changed her pad three times a day. You can look at how much of urine output has been there. What is she drinking and how much is she drinking in a 24 hour? Now, moving on to the examination. Now, you, you've seen a woman, you've taken the history, you've asked the questions, you've decided to do a bladder diary, you know, give it bladder diary to her, but before that, you, want, you would want to do an examination. Always start with general assessment, look for mobility, cognitive condition, BMI is very important. There's a direct relationship with obesity and stress incontinence and urge incontinence, both of them. And there is data, there's evidence published that if you lose about 10% of your weight, there can be somewhere between 50 to 70% improvement in your uh, overactive bladder symptoms, as well as stress incontinence symptoms. It appears that weight loss will have more beneficial effect in stress incontinence compared to urge incontinence. But again, more data, I think we need more data, more long-term data on that. Abdominal and pelvic examination for masses and scars of previous surgeries. Assess for vulval, um, so you just vulval erythema, dermatitis, atrophic vagina, fistula, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic floor muscle strength and levator trauma, and cough stress leak. So next slide, I've got these in a stepwise manner. One of the questions was, now, how do I actually do, talk me through a vaginal exam? So start with inspection, you know, you look for atrophy, dermatitis, erosions, lesions, also fusion, resorption, you know, for lichen sclerosis, for example. If you can see any obvious masses, if you can see prolapse beyond hymen, I've got some pictures that I will show you that. Uh, and then we were gonna say, a couple of pictures we've got here might be a little bit sensitive. So if you've got kids, kids at the background, you may not want them to see this. It's up, it's up to you, I just wanted to make that. It's closure. <laughs> um, next step is speculum examination, such as atrophy. Look at atrophy, discharge, blood, bleeding, lesions, also foreign body, you know, all those kind of things can be present. Uh, forgotten pessaries, I've seen 15 year old pessary that presented with the rectal vaginal fistula, actually. Palpation, digital examination. You assess for prolapse, tender trigger points, adnexal mass and pelvic floor muscle assessment. Uh, you look for the integrity of the muscle and defects, tone at rest and squeeze, coordination, endurance, force, hypertonic or hypotonic muscles. So this is uh, the, the platform on what our physiotherapy colleagues work. Of course, I don't want to pretend that I'm a physiotherapist. I can never be a physiotherapist. It's a great job, actually. And uh, I do have a lot of respect for our physiotherapists, Janetta and Amy in, uh, in Jean Hales. Um, but this is the, the platform based on that they work. So there are different kind of prolapses. So uh, <clears throat> this is a cystocele, as you see, you know, the, the, the large um, bladder prolapse. So uh, if this woman comes with, with urinary incontinence, well, this needs to be fixed first before you would think about you know, doing anything else. So, um, so this is important. Oh, this one, you no know, complete um, uh, vault and uterine inversion. So here is, this is your bladder. It's 
completely outside. And this part is the lower part of your rectum, and this is the pouch of Douglas. So um, you see that you know, th there's a very significant variation, and this comes in elderly women who have been putting off to come and see you for years and years and years. Or well, they have been presented, but for other things, and never actually brought up this, so therefore they never got an examination. So the way that you want to do an examination, the digital examination, whether you want to do single digit or two digit, it really depends on the vaginal capacity, how the patient tolerates it and how comfortable you are, of course. But uh, I, I think these pictures are really great in terms of showing where the finger goes and what you feel, really. This is very important. So um, as you see, look at this picture. It's going up and uh, going inside the vagina and up towards the sort of the upper left and upper right which would be these areas, these two muscles actually you're palpating. So these are your obturator muscles, okay? That they are, um, they are located on each side of the pelvis on the obturator foramen. Um, but when you, when you uh, so kind of sweep your finger downwards and then you come to this part, you are actually palpating this and this. These muscles are the part of your levator muscles. So this one has been mentioned ilio. Uh, coccygeus muscle, or this one is the pubal coccygeus muscle, as you see. So these are the muscles that are going around from one side to the other side, and of course they're symmetric. You know, the, 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 there are a symmetric um, um, presentation in the pelvis. Also, this one shows that you know when your finger goes in, what are you palpating? So that is the cervix right up there. So this is like halfway through the vagina. So your iliococcygeus, your pubococcygeus muscles, those are the ones that you're actually palpating. So hopefully this gives you a bit of an understanding and like if you've got a ten tender point, you can actually report a little bit better, uh, like with more, uh, being more conscious about where things are have gone wrong. Investigation, what would you do for a woman who has got urinary incontinence? So look, there is no fancy test really, okay? at the level of the primary practice as a GP, do an MSU, check for infection. That's the first thing. If you are allowed to do only one test, only one test, that should be an MSU. Um, you want to do cytology, it's really, um, it really depends on the risk factors. What are the risk factors? Uh, if someone has had the past radiation, if someone is a smoker, someone is elderly, if someone has got macroscopic hematuria or ongoing macroscopic hematuria, if someone has got sterile pyuria, and all those kind of things, you would want to do to include the cytology. So it is important to take that into consideration. And Liz, are you trying to show me something? No. <laughs> right. Bladder diary is the other thing that you would want to do, as I said, imaging for suspected masses and post-void residue volume and ultrasound it can be performed or in and out catheter or bladder scan, you can do that. Urodynamic study is something that we will do for the types to, you know, to identify or differentiate different types of urinary incontinence or those women who've got urge incontinence not uh, relieved by the medications, etc. And of course, you would include cystoscopy for those people with recurrent UTI and hematuria. Red flags, so refer to specialist. These are the ones that you need to consider referring to someone else because they are red flags and they, are, they actually um, show that there is something going on that is um, beyond just a very simple presentation for a urinary incontinence. So make sure that you would highlight those ones or look for those ones. Now, another question is, which specialist should I refer, you know? And I've got some examples here. Any condition involving upper renal tract goes to the urologist, okay? Simple. All malignancies of the renal tract go to the urologist. Stones in the renal tract go to the urologist. Vesalcovaginal fistulas or urethrovaginal fistulas, either a urogynecologist or a urologist. SUI, UUI, MUI, urogynecologist or urologist. Recurrent urinary incontinence, uh, failed previous treatment, urogynecologist or urologist. Concurrent prolapse, I would, uh, prolapse and urinary incontinence, I would highly expect that they would come to a urogynecologist or an experienced gynecologist. Ladder pain syndrome, either us or urologists. Rectovaginal fistulas, colorectal surgeon. Mesh complications, urogynecologist, but these always go into an MDT and there's always other people involved in those ones. Management. So we've got another 10 to 15 minutes. Am I right, Liz? 
that right? No, you can keep going, PM, that's fine. Okay, good, good, thank you. All right, conservative management. The first step in managing all urinary incontinences is conservative management, as simple as is, unless they have done the conservative management or you find complicating factors in them, those red flags, those ones, you don't need to waste time in doing physio for a woman who's got urinary incontinence and hematuria. You need to get on top of that. You need to uh, refer to find out what is the underlying cause. If someone's coming to see you first time ever, urinary incontinence, you can't find any, any significant risk factors, any of those red flags, you start your conservative management. Conservative management, weight loss, promote good bladder habits, bowel habits. There's a very nice document, two nice documents on the CFA, Continence Foundation of Australia um, website on good bladder habits and bowel habits that you can actually use. Proper fluid management, you no know, decreased caffeine and alcohol intake, avoid excessive fluid intake. Again, arbitrary, two liters. Um, we don't really have a very high level evidence to say what is exactly the, um, the maximum normal acceptable, but I usually use 1.5 to 2 liters for an average person. Minimizing uh, evening intakes, if not jury is a concern. Smoke cessation, medication review, especially with diuretics. Uh, usually people take diuretics at night time. You can actually bring it to an early afternoon so that by then, before going to sleep, the effect of the diuresis has been kicked in, that the diuresis has happened, and they would, they would have made a trip to the toilet before going to bed rather than waking up at night time because of the effect of diuresis uh, from your diuretic medication. Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy, physiotherapy. This is, again, very important one. Um, I can tell you that I can't, I can't be a urogynecologist without a physiotherapist, okay? as simple as it gets. Um, they, we go hand in hand, very close friends, and we always co-manage these patients. So I don't take any, any pride in being a, a solo practitioner. I always work with a physiotherapist, and I'm very proud to be working with them. Education and proper, about proper voiding techniques. I'll just make this one example. It's good for you. It might go a little bit over time, sorry. But people go to shopping centers, they want to go to toilet. They've got germophobia. They read a lot of things in there. So they go to the, to the toilet. They want to do a wee. They hover on the toilet. They, they don't actually sit on the toilet. So there's this gap between them. So you just like go down like this, and then you hover on the toilet. Worst possible thing you can do to your voiding and pelvic floor. To do that, you need to activate your pelvic floor muscles to be able to go into that pose, actually, OK? It's one of the core um, uh, exercises when you go to Pilates, actually, okay? So you need to activate those muscles. By activating those muscles, you are actually bringing a degree of blockage to your bladder outlet. So sitting down nice and relaxed with knees slightly elevated above the level of the hip is actually the position to be. You don't need to take a stool into the toilet and shopping center, but please talk to your patients about, you know, not hovering in a proper seating and you no know, proper um, position. All right, I'll move on. Pelvic floor muscle training, bladder training, you know, patient education, air suppression techniques, scheduled voiding, which is sort of like a um, uh, sort of timed voiding every three hours, every two hours for those people who've got sort of uh, incomplete bladder emptying. These are the things that your uh, physiotherapist will go in much greater detail when they see the patients on one of those very long consultations, of course. So supervised pelvic floor muscle physiotherapist by a dedicated pelvic floor physiotherapist uh, or a continence nurse um, is, is the way to go if you want to refer for physiotherapy. About 30% of the women don't really know the exact technique. Duration is about three to six months. You're looking at about 50 to 60% uh, improvement and um, improvement and cure, i.e. those people who get better and become dry, about 75 to 85%. Uh, a meta-analysis showed a 66% success rate in this. In the, in the continuation to your conservative management, you can use the pessaries, of course. I have never used any of these ones, but I've just put this on so that you can see. These are anti-incontinence devices. 
So anti-incontinence pessaries. So it's like a urethral insert, and these all, all go and sit inside the vagina. This is a urethral insert, whereas these ones are your pessaries, and this is a ring with a knob, ring with support with a knob, or a, sh a shafts with a knob. So uh, the way that you place them, this knob goes and sits under the bladder neck. Uh, so it's on the, in the anterior um, wall of your vagina. And that's how it would provide uh, um, uh, continence. Pessary use. Um, they need to have regular follow-ups. If it goes in, they need to come every four to six months for regular checkups. You will remove the pessary, have a look inside, make sure it's all good and put it back in again. And then another one there need to use vaginal estrogen for postmenopausal women. Ring pessaries can be removed and reinserted by the woman. We can teach them to do that, especially those women who are younger can do that. Good diet and bowel habits avoid constipation is very important. Risks associated with pessaries, they can cause erosion, they can cause bleeding, infection. The rate of them overall is around 5%. Expulsion can happen if the prolapse is large or the pessary size was not used correctly. And rarely the wrong size or shape can uh, lead to obstructed voiding of bowels. If you, put a, if you put one of these pessaries, always get the patient to do a wee before they go home, at least. Now, this algorithm I've devised myself, it's based on USANS and OXA guidelines for the management of OAB. Okay, this is for OAB. So the first line of management, you've got conservative management, lifestyle, bladder training, pelvic floor muscles, and all those kind of things that you can include in this. If this didn't work, you know, you went for this for about three months, no improvement, you know, or six months, no improvement. By continuing them, you go to the next step. Next step is your pharmacotherapy, which you use anticholinergics or beta-3 agonists or vaginal estrogen, desmopressin, TCAs, you know, depending on the situation. We don't really use TCAs these days. This is a bit of an uh, older one, but you know, people still, some people use. And if this didn't work, you know, we've tried this, you, you need to try a minimum of two of these not working or patient having severe allergy to them, can't tolerate them or even can't afford them, you know, to be honest. Some of them are very expensive. Then you move on to the advanced therapies, which is use of Botox or sacroneuromodulation or PTMS. So Botox is uh, injected into the bladder under uh, usually a general anesthetic or if facilities available can be done as an outpatient either. Uh, sacroneuromodulation is a pacemaker that is placed, it's an implantable pulse generator is the correct name for it, in the buttock on one side with a lead going inside, on the back going inside and sitting beside the third sacral nerve root. And if these don't work, of course, you would go to salvage options, which is sort of augmentation, cystoplasty, diversion, very, very significant um, uh, and highly, uh, uh, highly morbid surgeries. A summary of these medications. So oxybutynin tablets come in the form of, it's called ditropan, five milligram tablets. You use them in divided doses. I always start as 2.5 milligram BD or 2.5 milligram Nocte, depending on the severity, and I slowly work my way up based on the side effects in the patients. I have never been able to go above 5 milligram TDS. Most important thing before prescribing, make sure that the patient does not have glaucoma. Glaucoma is the absolute contraindication, but you need to be very careful about those women who have got dementia or confusion or altered mental status and those kind of things. Oxybutynin patch, it come, uh, which is oxytrol, 3.9 milligram per 24 hours twice a week. Uh, because it does not go through the liver, it creates less active metabolites in the body, therefore less side effects compared to ditropan, you know, dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, etc. But then it can cause 15% local reaction, and that can be really, really bothersome. Solifenacin or Vizicare comes in the form of 5 or 10 milligram tablets once a day. It's once a day tablet. Slow release, less side effects, of course, and generally better tolerated. If your patient was on 5 and then you give them 10, ask them not to go and break 5, but break 10 to make two 5 milligram tablets. There have been reports of blindness, but a part of the medication chipping into the eye, actually. There have been case reports on that. 
So again, a safety issue for you. Darifenacin, not very commonly used, but again, another uh, anticholinergic. It is called, comes in the form of Enablex, 7.5 or 15 milligram once a day. Um, the same principles as, as the solifenacin, but it does not really cr uh, cross a uh, blood-brain barrier. Therefore, it's safer in the, uh, in the elderly women if you wanted to use an, uh, one, of, one of these ones. Myrobicron or Betamiga, 25 or, 20, uh, or 50 milligram once a day tablet, and it um, uh, goes onto your beta 3 adrenoceptors. Most important side effect of this is hypertension. Whenever you start it, uh, whenever I start it, I get them to check their blood pressure in about two days' time, and again in seven days' time, and then after that, every month. Um, as an ongoing thing. Um, rate of uh, acute hypertension is about 15% with this medication. So it's not uncommon, it does happen. And vaginal estrogen, of course, for postmenopausal women, um, um, it, is, it comes in the form of Ovestin or Vagifem Low, and you start um, every night for two weeks uh, vaginally, and then after that, twice a week. And it restro restores your vaginal flora and pH. I'm going to whisk through this a little bit, um, sort of in the interest of time, but uh, you will get these slides so you can actually come back and look at these. These are grade of recommendation A. So this is based on very high level evidence, uh, use of anti muscarinics so contraindications and side effects, beta 3 agonists, which is your bitmiga or myrobicron, precautions and side effects of it, and vaginal estrogen as well as SNRIs, uh, which are amitriptyline, imipramine, and nortriptyline. This slide is from the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality of Healthcare. I have put a link to this page at the end of the slide. Do make yourself familiar with this. It's very useful, actually. It is not really written only for a specialist. You can use it too. And it's very useful, you know, complicated incontinence. It gives you a bit of a description of what I said, but even more details in there. Different types of incontinence and how you would manage them and all those things, you know, when it goes for the specialist management. So make yourself familiar with this. This is a very useful slide, uh, but it's too busy. I won't go through it right now in the interest of time. Surgical management of stress urinary incontinence. There are four options, four conventional options. There are actually more options, but then we will talk about four of them today. And I want you to be familiar with them. So I'm not gonna go very into much detail. And soon I will finish and we will go and you can quiz me on with your questions. Now, mid-urethral sling, barrage colpo suspension, pubo vaginal sling, urethral bulking agents. These are the four surgical options available for women with, urinary with stress urinary incontinence. So when we say there is a retropubic mid-urethral sling, it's like this. So it's gone through the vagina, just in the suburethral area. So in the middle of the urethra, mid portion of the urethra, and it goes in the retropubic space between the pubic bone and the bladder. So by the way of doing that, it creates a U-shaped kind of a support and it would obstruct whenever you cough or sneeze as the you know, bladenic wants to descend, this stops it from coming down and blocks the uh, uh, urethral or the bladder outlet actually. This is a transobturator. So the tape inserts and goes along the vaginal sidewalls and comes out in the obturator membrane here in this obturator fossa in the obturator membrane. So that's one end, it continues and goes like that. And there's other devices that go. So this is from, as you see, this is being pulled across from inside to outside. Okay, so there's another picture for you to understand what these are. Success rates, about 80 to 85% success rate. We've got long-term data on this, published 17 years data on this. Um, and uh, less than 75% if you are doing it as a secondary surgery, like a recurrent stress urinary incontinence. And overally, in the first run, if you're doing it in the first, first operation, there is no difference in the overall, overall success rates between retropubic and transobturator sling in short, medium, and long term. Again, this is, I think, it's an important slide for you to know, you know, and, and certainly you will get these slides. Complications that can arise and those rates of them. Anything in the form of bleeding, hematoma, bladder perforation, urethral injury, de novo or worsening of OAD, voiding dysfunction, difficulty passing urine or retention completely, mesh exposure or erosion, groin pain, and dyspareunia. 
And chronic pain, of course, is one of the other ones that would be very, very difficult to treat chronic pain. Birch colpo suspension is an abdominal surgery, but you don't actually enter the abdominal cavity. So it, you go again into the red CS space, but you go from the abdominal incision. And then you get, this is the bladder, this is the pubic bone, and as this is the bladder neck. So there are these stitches that would lift the bladder neck up and attach this to this ligament on each side. It's called Cooper's ligament or iliopectineal ligament. Usually we put two stitches is better than one stitch. Uh, according to a Cochrane review, of course. And uh, this is a pubovaginal sling where you would use a fascial sling. So this is exactly the same thing in terms of the principles of placement. Not, not exactly the same thing, but the same principle as a midrethral sling, as I showed you. But this harvests a part of the rectus sheath. This, see this woman, you've got the uh, incision here, like a cesarean section, you harvest, harvest this rectus sheath like this, and then you would go and place it from one end to the other end. This is the vagina, this is the urethra, and you're placing this underneath the urethra. This used to be the gold standard before the uh, mesh slings came out. And of course, because meshes are much easier to do, not too many incisions like this, and quicker recovery, quicker get discharged from hospital, shorter operation time, they just basically took over. But then again, because of the issues and problems that's been happening with mesh, there's been some negative publicity and not much use as much again. Um, another picture uh, comparing the Birch Colpo suspension with a pubovaginal sling or fascial sling. So if a woman has got stress urinary incontinence, and she doesn't want a mesh at all cost. I don't want mesh. You hear that a lot these days. This can be an option for them, actually. This is a very great surgery, very high success rate, and um, uh, it does work greatly in the long run. But of course, a bigger surgery with more um, uh, comorbidities, of course. When people say that they've, done, they've had a bulking agent, this is how it's done. So it's done cystoscopically. With the camera, you only go into the urethra, so uh, it, it's like this normally. And then you would put the needle underneath and then you inject the bulking agent. The bulking agent bulks up here and creates a cushioning effect, cushioning effect, and makes the urethra narrower. So the euro, um, or what do we call it? The, the physics of it is that uh, because it's narrower, the resistance in the tube goes higher, which means that your urethra closure pressure at rest is higher and provides a better closure pressure. And um, this is how it looked like in the beginning. It's open and gaping. You would do one injection and then another injection and it would become a very narrow one. So by the way of doing this, you would create a kind of a, a co better coaptation and a cushioning effect of the submucosa. And this is a, like one of my real patients, you know, as I'm injecting, as you can see. So it's like bringing this cushioning effect here. This is beautiful. Take home message. It means that we're getting to the end. Happy. Meticulous and detailed history. Pays off to spend a little bit more time in the first go, as I said. History, 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 okay? Remember that. Be systematic in your assessment. Examine, document, investigate what you find uh, necessary to be investigated. And don't underestimate the value of conservative management. It's, it, it does good to the patient. Even if it fails, it brings some good foundations for the woman. Weight loss is always good. Not smoking is always good, not only for urinary incontinence. Look for complex features in history and examination and refer to a specialist. So if you put these four uh, in front of you, when you see a woman with urinary incontinence, you will never go wrong, never. And I've got these resources here. So these two are Australian websites, the uh, Australian Safety and Quality in Healthcare. And there's a bladder diary. We've got a fun, good one in Gene House that you can use, International Urogynia Association. You can download um, these uh, patient information leaflets in many languages like Chinese, um, Swahili's, you know, those kind of things, if available, of course. <laughs> and then give it to patients about like urinary incontinence, prolapse, all those kind of things. It's called yourpelvicfloor.org leaflets. Uh, there's an interactive SUI care pathway in the uh, uh, safety and quality healthcare. 
nice guidelines, of course, and CFA has got a very nice website, a web page uh, of a lot of um, uh, materials for healthcare professionals to, to, um, to use and read, actually. It's very good. Thank you. That is the end of my talk. Sorry, how much? Uh, oh, God, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. That was <laughs> absolutely wonderful. I'm uh, just so pleased to hear it again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got one question um, from Kate. How long do you trial medication before deciding that it hasn't worked? Yes. So if you're trying Ditropan, how long do you trial it for? If someone tolerates it, does not show side effects to it, like i.e. they can tolerate and do not do side effects, I would go at least for eight weeks before I would assess the symptoms. So about two months time. If in two months time I see that there is some improvement and no side effects at all, actually uh, I can bump up the dose. If, if the dose is up to the level that the patient is starting to get side effects, of course you can't go further up. So you're kind of bound to that. Um, the option of non-PBS options are there also. So if someone did not respond well to ditropan because it's an immediate release medication, not going back to uh, what Liz says. So you can actually um, try Vesicare if they can afford it because it's an expensive medication. So with, ditrop uh, with ditropan or solifenacin or um, darifenacin or Marabecker on any of them, I would at least go for about eight weeks, two months before thinking to moving to another medication. Um, Payam, one of the questions um, that uh, was asked was the options for patients that cannot tolerate um, the medications that you've recommended. What do you do then? Yes. So um, if you're talking, so this is uh, like an OAB case, of course, you know, uh, you've got a woman who's got overactive bladder. She has got and, uh, like a closed angle glaucoma, for example, you can't give her ditropan, you can't give her salifenosine, you can't give her darifenosine. You tell her about Betmiga, she says, oh, hang on, this is $34 a month, it's too expensive, I can't buy this. Then you think about, okay, then what I'm going to do with her? These ones, you continue, continue with your, with your um, conservative management, pelvic floor muscle exercises and bladder training, if still do not see any improvements, the next option for these people is the option of going towards those third level of management. So you can use Botox, you can use SNM, or you can use PTNS. To be honest, PTNS has been just recently added to the um, Medicare online system. So it's got the MBS uh, item numbers for it. And it can be done uh, as, a, as a treatment for these women. Um, compared to Tolteridine, as one study has compared it to tolteridine, uh, which is another anticholinergic, it has got similar efficacy, but less side effects. So that's something that can be tried. And if uh, Natasha was here, Natasha Kostura, one of our, um, one of our uh, physicians in, uh, in, in Jean Hales, she does acupuncture and very supportive of it. And I don't think there's any harm in thinking about those things outside of the box, you know, not to not think too medical. There are published papers that support the use of uh, acupuncture. So you can actually try that also to see how it works. But generally speaking, simple answer to that question is that if someone has tried the anticholinergics or is not able to tolerate them, you go to the third level of management. Options of Botox, SNM, or PTNS. Pam. Um, can you just give us a brief overview of how you diagnose the severity of a vaginal prolapse? Just a guide, a quick guide for us. Sure. If we've sure. got a patient who comes in and she says, I've got a prolapse, and you want to sort of get an assessment of how severe that prolapse is, how do you yeah. do it? Yeah, yeah. So... I guess the simplest way to assess this is during the examination we're talking. You get the woman in the position, same as you want to do a pap smear, for example. You ask the woman to give you a push, like a Valsalva maneuver. If you're able 
to see the prolapse coming beyond the hymen, but it protrudes and comes out beyond the hymen, you have got a minimum of like a, like a stage three prolapse, okay? And that is something that you would need to think about then, okay, then it's like a stage three prolapse. It is something that um, is classified as one of the severe ones. You start with uh, stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. So that's just the prolapse itself. However, the prolapse can also present with other symptoms. So if a prolapse is presenting with obstructed urine, like they're not able to completely empty their bladder, or it's causing pain, or it's causing erosion, bleeding, infection, those ones I would classify that the one that would need to be attended more urgently than reassurances, if that makes sense. And as Professor Dwyer used to say, Professor Dwyer, one of my great mentors that I've got the honor actually to be one of his trainees before. Uh, so Prof Dwyer always says, a prolapse that does not come out beyond hymen, it is unlikely to be responsible for the symptoms of, of your patients. So think again, review again, examine again, ask again, uh, just to make sure that you haven't missed anything else. So that's, that's, that's an important key for that. We have another question for you about uh... Uh, ditropan, how long can a patient stay on ditropan long term? Yes, so um, there is no really, uh, there's not a specific, like a special limit to say that you can only stay on this for five years. You know, it's not like the hormone replacement therapy, for example, by WHI trying to say like five or seven years. Um, people can stay on them as long as they need it, need it. The ideology of putting a woman on an anticholinergic is that you would provide reduction of the symptoms, or alleviation of the symptoms. So you make, it, make the symptoms less severe. And by doing that, you would allow them to engage easier and better in lifestyle modification and pelvic floor physiotherapy and bladder training. And usually after about a few months time, which I often do, is usually at the end of like three to six months, if they have done physiotherapy and they've seen improvement, they say that, okay, it's all good, I'm dry now, I would actually wean off and see whether they actually need it or not. If they, if they get a rebound of the symptoms, it means that they still need this medication or they might need more with the physio. Um, if they have maxed out on the physio and you talk to your physiotherapy colleague and say that, look, we've done whatever we can and she's actually doing really good, so then you need to think about, okay, then, do we need to look into this as a long run medication? And there is no, there is no wrong or right answer here. You can continue on Ditropan in long term. And how long is long term? I've had people who've been on this for 10 years. And um, so say in the course of several years being on the, on the Ditropan medication, it's not something that would necessarily um, surprise me because usually these conditions are long term and long run. So one of the um, questions put, sent in was a case and, and uh, it, a 33 year old woman, 12 months postpartum from a forcep delivery with yes. stress incontinence. Yes. She leaks when she jumps, runs and lifts, but she'd like to be able to go back to jogging and planning another pregnancy. She's seen a physio. What would you do for this woman? Right on. So for the women who are between pregnancies and still have not completed family, you know, stress incontinence surgeries are not really favored much. Unless it doesn't mean, uh, although it doesn't mean that you can't do them. You know, we've had probably just a handful of cases that might have had that kind of surgery, but after extensive um, counseling, I guess it is best to avoid any surgical management in these women if they are still bothered, bothered by the stress incontinence and they have not completed family, that option of bulking agent, that would buy you some time actually. The bulking agent is a minimally invasive surgery, it's a day procedure and it's done so sort of like, it takes 10 minutes to do literally. And they come in, have the procedure done and they go home. They can actually even do it under sedation and local. And that would provide you with some continence it's the least effective of all, okay, in terms of like, if you want to classify them, 
the least effective of all, but it buy, buys you time. The other option for these women is, if you want to th think non-surgical, is the option of pessaries. We can use continuous pessaries in them. Continuous pessaries also will help a lot. And because these are younger women, more dexterous, you can actually teach them to remove and insert as needed. So say for the weekend, they can have it in, and for the first weekdays, for a couple of days, they can leave it out. And you can still continue with physiotherapy in these cases, you know, there's no harm in it. So they just continue as a maintenance with physiotherapy. They would go with the um, sort of lifestyle modifications, treat constipation, and all those kind of things that we would normally do. But forceps is a very significant risk factor. Vaginal delivery itself is a risk factor. So um, these ones would be best to cancel about future pregnancies and what needs to be done afterwards also. So that's another very big topic, childbirth and urinary incontinence. So, so another quest, question or is about, is it similarly about postpartum incontinence, both vowel and urinary, that this is fairly common immediately postpartum. Yes. And how often do you see these symptoms ever persisting? Because I think in most cases, it res they resolve, don't they? Exactly, exactly. By the time, by the six months time, when you see, look, we, we do have, a, I do run a perineal clinic in, uh, in Dandenong Hospital. It's the only perineal clinic in Monash Health. So anyone in Monash Health who gets a third or fourth degree tear, they will come to that clinic. And it's a multidisciplinary clinic. We've got a physiotherapist, Haley Irving, lovely Haley, and um, a colorectal surgeon also, and two fellows and registrar and nurse. So um, in that clinic, we would see a lot of these women. By six months' time, I can tell you that about sort of like 90% of these people are asymptomatic. Only about 10% of them have got some residual symptoms. If someone has got persistent fecal incontinence by then, I can tell you that there is an underlying um, sphincter deficiency. And as part of our assessment in the perineal clinic, these women will be assessed by, a, by an endoanal ultrasound and a manometry to assess the structure of the anal sphincter complex as well as the function of the sphincters. And for some people, of course, we've offered uh, elective Caesar in the, in the subsequent surgeries. And then once they've completed the family, they've done a, like a reconstruction of their sphincter. We have another question. If a patient has severe spinal issues with severe urinary incontinence, failed medication trial, and the orthopod does not want to operate, um, Botox has been recommended. However, the patient is very upset about needing to self catheterize for this and feels that her back pain would prevent her from doing this comfortably. Are there any other options for people with severe spinal injuries? Yes, yes, yes. It's a very complex and yes. very difficult issue. No, thank you, Marie, for that question. No, definitely. Uh, <coughs> So uh, it's good that uh, Marie has raised this, that uh, when you are going to give Botox, the patient, one of the criteria, there are several criteria on the MBS, but one of them is the patient needs to be able and willing to self-catheterize. The risk of urinary retention is about 1 in 20, almost 5% that would happen, and about 30% risk of uh, urinary tract infections after Botox injection. So that poses a bit of a risk, of course, and this kind of woman that Marie has raised has already has got background conditions. So for these ones, really Botox is an option, yes, but then if she has got concerns about self-catheterization, so your options are either you would think about instead of doing a self-catheterization, you can do a suprapubic catheter at the time, and you would leave that in after the Botox and do a trial of void. If the woman is, is able to pass urine and she passes trial of void, no issues or problems, you can remove the suprapubic catheter. So that, that's, that's it done. Because if you are not able to pass urine, or if you're gonna go into retention after Botox, you would go immediately. You won't go two months later. It's just immediate afterwards. And as time goes on, your retention gets better. So for that case, the suprapubic catheter can stay in 
and provides the um, catheterization if she did not want to catheterize herself. So that's one option. The other option is that instead of doing Botox, she can try PTNS. PTNS of uh, posterior tibial nerve stimulation, which is um, you insert an electrode in the posterior tibial nerve, same as the acupuncture done, but of course it's an electrical stimulation. Uh, the course of treatment is for three months time, and uh, of course we are able to offer that in Jean Hales. Uh, Amy does that in, uh, in Miss Melbourne. She provides, of course she provides TTNS, which is transcutaneous. It's a surface electrode, it's not actually an electrode that goes in to the bladder. Sacral neuromodulation is the other option. It really depends on where the spinal abnormalities and how severe it is and whether she would be a, candid, a surgical candidate to have an implantable pulse generator. And there is a two-year follow-up RCT comparing Botox versus sacral neuromodulation prospective randomized controlled trial. Uh, at this stage in time, they both stand same in terms of effectiveness in relieving uh, symptoms of a refractory overactive bladder. So Marie, those three options for your patient are probably are to think about. Are there any other questions, please? I think that Pam has really covered most of the questions that have been sent in in his wonderful talk tonight. And if there are no further questions, I think we can call the evening to a close. And Pam, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you all for attending tonight.